That's, that's our flyer. Have you seen that one on the back? That's something we've done for what we're trying to do to our soils. And that's regenerate them. Trying to make people think about it and look at soil in a different way. Not it's just as dirt. You kind of need a degree of failure to actually kick you up the arse to get that degree of success. So there was a great um, catchphrase from Sir Ernest Rutherford, who was New Zealander, and he went on to split the atom. And he always used to say, we haven't got the money, so we've got to think. And I always quite like that, because I think it's terribly easy to throw money at a problem. I spend my whole time marvelling at it and thinking, yeah, I could do that a bit cheaper. <laughs> How did it start? It sounds like it's a work in progress. I suppose it started when I came back home, was without any agricultural education. I used to be a journalist and photographer. And um, I just came home and started asking questions as I would have done with a journalist, you know. How do you make money out of a 250 acre farm? And how do you reduce the cost of what you produce? And I kept asking and kept asking and trying to find out who had the lowest cost of production. And it was very simple because it's a very simple mathematical equation in terms of cost of production. And if you get a lot of grazed grass into cows, you get a lot of very cheap milk and very good quality milk. And so gradually we changed from a high input thing where we were putting a lot of grain into cows to something where we were 100% grass fed. You're really in experimental mode, aren't you? Yeah, I am at the moment. Completely experimental. Yes, I am. How does that feel? Exciting, because I can see already the vigour of, of this regrowth. There's cow pack here now. You know, we got dung worms in them now. And what the dung worms don't eat? I mean, the birds is getting in and spreading them, eating them. The habitat in, this, in these pastures is just different altogether. And that's the same in the soil. I'd be looking at the cows and the cows are telling me, this grass sucks. <laughs> They'd be trying to eat stuff out of the hedgerows here, which is, you know, what we're famous for in Cornwall. And it wasn't until Jerry Brunetti opened my eyes and he'd taken off a lot of the forage samples from hedgerows and tested them through the traditional methods of testing cattle food and found that actually they had a much, much greater depth of minerals. And the cows tell you that, you know, they'll go off and go and graze all the trees so you get this great mushrooming effect branching out over the fields. We all talk about compaction, and our biggest problem is you know, a ton of water. It just comes like tropical rain. And what I feel is the water's absorbing in. We're not getting the soil erosion. And if we can get it to penetrate in the soil, get it down deeper, get it holding down deeper, increasing that organic matter, we're not getting a wash off. This is the River Tamer at Port Stevon and Cornwall. And because I live on the River Tamer, I've got you know, quite big interest with it. But the situation is the colour of it, and that's brown and that's sediment. I mean, this is the most valuable topsoil that is disappearing off our land and down the rivers. Now, year on year, it's just getting a bigger problem. It's just frightening that this valley will get flooded and how quickly it'll rise and drop as well now. And the amount of times that uh, the people living on the, on the valley further down here that being trapped in their properties because, because of the rivers come up and how quick it comes up. You know, this, this is our most important topsoil. The most important thing we've got is our soils. That's all we've got to grow our crops in. So it goes back to healthy soils, healthy animals, healthy humans. When trying to move to an ecological system, you spend a lot more time observing the animals. And, you know, we're just trying to allow cows to express their cowness. And they play, they're like naughty teenagers and they experiment. And actually also, when they're going around eating the weeds, they learn from their mothers as well. So it's kind of like teaching kids to eat vegetables. Now, if I hadn't heard about grazing grasses this high and, and treading grasses, I would never have tried it. 
But because we couldn't get there to cut the grasses, we started treading grasses behind electric fences. And I just so fascinated how well the animals died. And this was only rye grass, and I would not specifically say it was good for what we're trying to do. But the animals, they loved it. They ate it back, and how well they'd done on it. And we had the proteins in the bottom of them. We had the energy in the grasses going to seed. And that sort of started to prove to me that we've got to move to the next step. And the one thing I want to see is my worms increase. And it's not happening as quick as I would like to do. And I know they want fungi. And my pet subject, which I love, is mycorrhizae. It just fascinates me and fascinates me. That mycorrhiza colonizes in the roots and they can start talking to each other. Now if aphids start attacking that crop with the mycorrhiza there, with a the colonization of them, that mycorrhiza can let off their own chemical that the aphids won't attack it. Um, and that's quite natural. But where there's no money to be made out of, by chemical firms, whatever, we don't invest the money in that. And that seems absolutely erratic to me. Instead of being down that conventional road with having to work with chemicals, I mean, life is more interesting now because you've actually got to be a farmer. You've got to work with it now. When did you change and what caused you to change? Change, big change in my life. I had a brother committed suicide and uh, we had to give up a farm. All of a sudden it was all gone. It was just me. And I didn't really see a reason to get out of bed at one time. And I had to do something and I had to get my brain moving. And probably for 12 months, I just, just got on the computer and done research. Um, and it allowed me to look at organic more and it allowed me, give me time. It gave me time that I could do it. Probably if I was in an intensive system and with the bank still breathing down my neck, it wouldn't give me a chance to look at other systems. You know, I didn't want to be tied to a bill coming in that I was wondering how I was going to pay that next bill. When you start buying stuff in, you're told, oh, your cows are short of this vitamin or that mineral, and, and here's the supply of it. And then when you actually start going into the biochemistry of it, you find that actually a lot of these minerals, yes, they'll test in the lab, but they're not actually available to the cow. So they go in one out and out the other, you know, rubbish in, rubbish out. And then you say, well, what's the best, most effective way to get it into the cow? And what's the cheapest, most cost-effective way? We do bring in some seaweed. They absolutely love it. I mean, seaweed is, is enormously mineral rich. It's interesting because there is a whole way that the cow's hormonal and glandular system expresses its health through certain areas of the coat. And on the cows, you can tell whether their thyroid system, which affects their whole metabolism, is functioning correctly by looking for a really big, dark patch. Do you see there's a, a on the neck of that cow, see there's a darkest patch there? Yeah. Just in front of the legs. Increasingly, the price of seaweed it's just gone up and up and up because more and more it's being used in the food additive industry and also um, in the pharmaceutical industry. And I was thinking, I, I'm not going to be able to afford to do this. But after a couple of weeks, they then started just taking very small quantities and they, a bag a week was amply sufficient. And in fact, I mean, there's a really interesting piece of work that Fred Provenza did. And when I was saying that he has this wonderful mischievous streak in his eyes, what he actually did was, there's a particular herd of cows in the university, maybe it was a university herd, and they were all on a total mixed ration. It's sort of a mix of wagon, and they mix everything up with an excavator and, and then feed it all out. So what Fred did is he split the herd in half at random. One lot, he continued to feed this mixed ration that they were getting and was considered to be the best food for them. And the other half were able to free access all the ingredients that were in the mixed ration. And what he actually found, the cows that were able to free access all the ingredients ate less of all the expensive components and a bit more of the bulk. And they were healthier and they produced more milk and for less money. And you didn't have to mix it. And I love work like that. It just, you know, it just, it, it, it's, what scientists, it's what the scientists should be doing. You know? <laughs> we're still working the soils, but in a different way. We're still trying to work with how we can put less input with less machinery costs. Well, uh, we try not to use it. We use animals instead to do the job. You're not using them extractively where they're locked up in a barn and stuff is fed and carried to them and then they're out as soon as they're no longer productive. You know, here they've got other uses. Somebody asked me this week, because I haven't been that well, and somebody, a consultant, had come in this week looking at figures and he said, do you still want to keep on with cattle? Do you want to still keep doing what you're doing? I thought, well, if I can't go and see my cat, I'll just well give up. 
but no, no, I love seeing animals, being with my animals, spending time with them. My family's wealth was originally based on, on minerals and mining and a very extractive business. And, um, you know, this is the complete antithesis. So I'm fascinated by sort of kind of families and countries that have a heavy reliance on extractive industries because, you know, inevitably these things are finite. OK, you know, in the short term, you might live high on the hog, but um, in the longer term, you're on a bit of a hiding to nothing. I'm looking longer term and thinking natural systems, the way they work, they build up slowly and then you get exponential growth. And, you know, that's what I'm waiting to kick in. <laughs> I hope I'm not going to have too many more grey hairs before it does finally kick in. But it's a beneficial result and I feel I'm doing right. Everybody else may not think I'm doing right looking around at me, but time will tell, won't it? Time will tell. What do your neighbours think of the way you're running your operation? <laughs> to be honest, truly, I've had too much feedback. I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting. <laughs> Perhaps they talk a lot beyond my back. I don't know. <laughs>